we were um, surveying the nutritionists, I would say the top three things that they ranked as importance to them were going to be price, uh, variability, and availability. And so it's really going to depend on the region of where these byproducts are being produced. Obviously, the less you have to ship them, the cheaper that's going to be to incorporate it. Um, and then, yeah, things just kind of change throughout the year, too. I know the almond told price really can fluctuate throughout the year because they do all of the harvesting at one time. And so it's like you have this huge supply of almond holes and then kind of as it dwindles, the price will go up. So I know that's definitely going to be one of their biggest concerns when thinking about what byproducts to incorporate. Hi, I'm Bill Weiss, host of the Dairy Black Belt, uh, Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. My guest today is Dr. Katie Swanson, who's a dairy lecturer at Cal, at Cal Poly, working or teaching and doing research in nutri dairy nutrition and management. Part of her, she did a, some of her graduate work and a, some postdoc work at UC Davis, and she spent a lot of time working on byproducts, a lot of time on working on almond hulls. But she, while she was there, she conducted a survey on the use of byproducts in, in California. So why don't you run down what, what you found with that survey, Katie? Sure. Yeah, we, we wanted to do this survey um, partly to help kind of support some of the work that's already being done in California to reduce methane emissions associated with organic waste and also the livestock sector. And so we really wanted to see what are all the byproducts that are being produced in California, since there isn't really a lot of good data on that. Um, what are the end uses for those byproducts? Are they already going to livestock? Are they going to landfill? Are they going for compost? Um, and just kind of getting a better estimation of what is happening with our organic waste, specifically a lot of our agricultural organic waste, mm -hmm. um, and kind of see how is, how is livestock already playing a role in helping to reduce that waste that's going for landfill or for compost. What, what are some of the major byproducts fed out there then? Yeah, so what we found so far is um, one of the big ones definitely is rice bran. Um, almond tolls is right there with it. So almond tolls is a really big one in California. Uh, grape pumice is also really common, especially for, I would say, like beef cattle um, and dry cows, heifers. Uh, tomato pumice is another one that we see a lot in California. Um, condensed whey, dry distiller's grains, of course, and brewer's grains. Um, although the brewer's grains, I think, are kind of localized around the big breweries. <laughs> and then a lot of these byproducts, especially like the vegetable and fruit, I'm not going to call them waste, but byproducts, they're, they're pretty wet. So are these, the users very local or do they do they actually ship some of these around state or even maybe out of state? Yeah, we do have some shipping, but I would say that they are localized to kind of region. And um, so especially with those wetter byproducts, you know, we're not shipping them from Southern California way up to Northern California, um, but definitely like throughout the Valley, there's gonna be a lot of movement of byproducts I know that some dairies that get more of those wet byproducts, like especially that um, vegetable coal waste or like grape pumice or um, even some of the bakery waste, they'll be getting deliveries every few days. So they're really not storing it for any long term time because, you know, you do worry about storage with the, the really wet stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think we are doing some shipping, but it's not going very long distance if it's really wet. What you said you're you're looking at how what proportion is used by by livestock, and this would be total, not just dairy. So what of these? How much would go to a landfills, and how much are we trying to re upcycle into animal product? We don't have any firm numbers yet. Um, we we have a pretty good idea of what is already being fed to livestock, but we're having trouble kind of. Um, quantifying how much is being produced. Uh, a lot of processors don't want to tell you how much waste yeah. they have. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that from the nutritionists that we surveyed and brokers that we surveyed, about 50% of the byproducts that are being fed in California are going to dairy. And then the next biggest sector would be beef cattle. So dairy is taking in a lot of those byproducts that are coming out of the agricultural um, organic waste. Are they with these byproducts, one of the, of the, especially the ones you listed, they can be quite variable in nutrient composition. Yes. So, so how are, how are people, this is an area of great interest of mine, but how are people 
nutritionists especially incorporating risk or variation risk into formulation for these byproducts. So we did ask the nutritionists kind of like what they rank as their biggest concerns with feeding byproducts and variability was definitely up there very high in the ranking. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of them are just kind of going off of averages, you know, trying to do at least monthly testing just to keep an eye on things. Um, also, you know, buying from the same processors or brokers to try and keep the source the same. So at least, you know, like the whole um, processing method is relatively uniform. But I know like with something like bakery waste, it's really so variable. And so you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons of your diet might not be exactly the same and perfectly balanced every day. But if you're getting a, a huge price reduction, that could be worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am assuming these, these by most of these byproducts would be priced substantially less than say corn or celery or some of these very standardized commodities. Um, so how, how important is price, I guess, is uh, how cheap do they have to be to get a nutritionist and a producer interested in feeding them? Sure. So when we were um, surveying the nutritionists, I would say the top three things that they ranked as importance to them were going to be price, uh, variability, and availability. And so it's really going to depend on the region of where these byproducts are being produced. Obviously, the less you have to ship them, the cheaper that's going to be to incorporate it. Um, and then, yeah, things just kind of change throughout the year, too. I know the almond hold price really can fluctuate throughout the year because they do all of the harvesting at one time. And so it's like you have this huge supply of almond holes and then kind of as it dwindles, the price will go up. So I know that's definitely going to be one of their biggest concerns when thinking about what byproducts to incorporate. Avonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonic's focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. And then on some of these, and again, some of these I don't know very much about, are they available year-round or would the, like tomato pumice only be available a few months and then They'd have to find another byproduct or what's, what's the time availability of these? I would say in general, like something like tomato pumice is not going to be available all year round, but I know at least like we have a Campbell's factory outside of Sacramento. And so because they're constantly bringing in tomatoes, even from out of state, like in that local area, tomato pumice is available all year round. But if you're more of like getting it from a smaller processor, like kind of localized, you might not have that availability all the time. Um, you know, things like brewer's grains, we are going to have all year round. Um, cotton seed kind of depends on <laughs> where we can get it shipped in from since we're not producing that much in California. Rice bran is also going to be one that we'll have all year round. Uh, and lots of things, California kind of is the first, always the first at stuff. So you see any new, new byproducts on the horizon? So I know there's been some talk about grape pumice, and I know that there are some dairies that have been incorporating more grape pumice into their dry cow and heifer rations. Um, I think a lot of that also just has to do on availability. So especially um, in some areas in Northern California and even maybe like around Lodi where they have more of those wineries, you'll see more of grape pumice showing up in those diets. Uh, we actually did some work recently looking at the potential of including hemp residue. So the plant material that's left, left over after extracting cannabinoids. Oh, and it, okay. it actually is a really good fiber source. It's highly digestible, um, quite comparable to alfalfa for crude protein content. But of course, then you have cannabinoids like the <laughs> CBD and THC showing up in animals. So I don't know if that one's ever gonna be a thing, but. Well, there's always something new. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, like I said, this, the use, effective use of byproducts is essential to keep the dairy industry sustainable. So I'm really glad you're, you're working in this area. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.